Good morning, everyone. I'm glad we can still worship God uh, during the midst of this severe uh, Omicron virus spreading in Hong Kong. We'll ask uh, for the mercy of the Lord. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask that you have mercy on Hong Kong, particular, particularly those, the elderly, those who have contracted the virus, those who have not got the vaccination shots. We ask that you protect them, spare their lives. And we will also hand the following time into your hand, the message that we are going to look at this morning. We ask your Holy Spirit to speak with us through your word, that perhaps this is the time that we should make a confession to you, O Lord. Examine us, examine our motivation, so that we will be a pleasing sons and daughters to you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know if you have realized or aware that for the Chinese culture, it is very difficult to admit our fault, to make an apology for our wrongdoings. Um, this is the first problem of making a confession for the Chinese. And if we were to make a confession uh, when we have no choice, we are not really making a confession. For example, if you um, step on somebody's uh, foot uh, on the MTR, you say, oh, I'm sorry. No, but if the guy gives you a dirty look, you know, I've seen that, I've already said sorry, what do you want? Well, I mean, the guy who offended the other guy is more angry than the uh, offended people. Second situation is, like when you say, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm late. This is no sign of remorse because he has no choice but say that he's late. And then there's a th third type of confession. Suppose the mother spills some coffee onto the uh, homework of his son, or of, of her son. Then she will say, oh, I'm sorry, I, I, I uh, 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 spilled coffee on your homework. But then she will say, but well, you're not supposed to put your homework on the dining table. Now, the thing is, the, um, as she makes the confessions, she is also making the blame. I mean, the kids always put the homework there. Now, as we reflect on our, reflect on our uh, apology syntax, often we have this, I'm sorry, but, but, there is this but. Uh, well, we can shift the blame. You know what, who we can shift the blame to? We can shift the blame to Adam. When God asked Adam, you remember, did you eat from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? You know what, what, what Adam say? Well, the woman whom you gave me, she gave to me some fruit and I ate it. You see, so, so we can say, well, we inherit this from Adam. So this is not our responsibility. So this morning I would like to share with you from the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel 15, a self-deceived confession by Saul. Now, we are, look, we are gonna look at it uh, in three, three major points. First, Saul's self-contradictory confession uh, 24 and 25 and then the result of his confession so no forgiveness rather further rejected by the Lord and a symbolic turn uh, a tearing okay the rope was torn uh, Samuel's rope was torn then and in the last point we'll look at Saul's second apology really in scripture we see two apologies together but then this second and last apology was a face-saving confession. Uh, for those who are, rem are familiar with um, this passage, we will know that the context is, uh, Saul was asked to fight the Amalekites, and he did not follow God's command 
to kill everyone. He spared the life of Agag. And then when Samuel confronted Saul, he denied. He claimed to have obeyed the Lord. And then when Samuel announced the judgment, that is in verse 23, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Now the passage we are looking at today is Saul's response to the rejection of the Lord or to the judgment of the Lord. Now the first question before we read the passage is Saul's confession made to the Lord or to Samuel? Verse 24 Saul said to Samuel I have sinned for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now here uh, from the text the apology was made to whom? To Samuel. Now is it that because Samuel is God's prophet so the apology make, made to Samuel is the same as to God. Notice the word transgress. The word transgress in Hebrew is a very very common word 400 sometimes. This is not the, a word for sin. This just mean what? Cross over. Overlook. Overstep. Actually lexicon suggests it should be translated as overlook, overstep. So here what Saul is doing, he has toned down the problem that he had. Now if you look at the two verses side by side, you'll see a very stark contrast. The Lord said, you have rejected the word of the law, the Lord. And then Saul said, well, I have overstepped your commandment. Now commandments in Hebrew is the word. So Saul has a different perspective. I take this as a self-deceived perspective. So. His justification, he thought his problem is just overlooking. Now the truth of the matter is, how we look at God's standard. This is not the first time. This is the second time. Because the first time the, the, the Lord asked him to kill everyone and he didn't do, do it. Now if we hold on to, uh, to God's holy standard, we will not respond as what Saul did here. I'm glad that when I w was a young believer, when I was in Canada, I knew a brother. He is very strict. And then er er anything that, that we do wrong, okay, spiritual brother, he's like uh, uh, been the Christian for a long time. I'm a young believer. And they say, hey, this is sinful. You have committed a sin. Well, at the time, I, I was taken aback. Whoa, this is sin. See, you know, as university, university students, you, you know, maybe take a beer or some, you know, something that you're not really supposed to do as a Christian. And he will say, this is sinful. If we take this kind of attitude, then we will, like half of Saul's problem will be gone, holding to God's holy standard. So clearly, even at, on his face, Saul did not, take God's word seriously. Rejected. To God this is not rejected. Now the next observation we have is we see a repetition here. Commandment of the Lord and your words. Now in Hebrew when you see repetition it's emphatic. So now how are, you, how are, you, how are we to understand this? Is it Saul is Saul emph emphasizing that it is the very word of God uh, God's mouth, Samuel's word that he has violated? No, I don't think so. I think the repetition that your word is at who is this your? Samuel's. So this is because Saul was seeking Samuel's favor. So he add this your word. So this is, I say, I call this misguide, misguided object of confession. Saul was seeking man's forgiveness and man's apology not God and then what did he say because I fear because I fear and then obey actually fear and obey when 
when appear together gives us very important insight. You know what the insight is? Whom you fear, whom you obey. If Saul's word is taken uh, by face value, what does it mean? It means that Saul feared the people more than the Lord. The very essence of the fear of the Lord is to be fear the Lord so much that we will obey. In, in our real world, if you fear somebody, you will listen and obey what he said. So, now this is very interesting because listen is the key word in Samuel chapter 15. It actually ap appears eight times. More interestingly, four times it has this Hebrew construction, listen plus voice. But this voice was never translated in English. So in Hebrew, la listen plus a preposition, bait plus voice means obey. Four times. Let me show you this four times that it, ap did, did, uh, it appears. First is verse 1. Now listen to the voice, which is not translated, of the words of the Lord. So that's the thesis of the chapter. Saul is to obey the Lord's word. And then, when Saul didn't obey, verse 19, Samuel Chan confronted Saul, Why haven't you listened to the voice of the Lord? Literally. You know Sam, Saul's response? I have listened to the voice of the Lord. Exactly opposite as what God has been saying. Now here, this is the last time. Saul said, I have listened to their voice, not to God's voice. You see, now the question is, did Saul really listen to the people's voice? That is the question. Well, I don't think so. So I think Saul did not listen to the Lord, did not listen to the people. He was only listening to his own voice. That's why he became sinful. So this is the irony here. You know, the author is making an ironic use of listen in verse 4. See, in verse 4 in English, Saul summoned the people. Summon in Hebrew is cause to listen. It is exactly opposite. Saul made the people listen to him, not the other way around. He's the king. Why would the king have to listen to his people? You see? So and and and, and then the second time it appeared and, and and the second evidence that Saul did not listen to the people. Verse nine. Verse nine was the author's description of what Saul did. Now if you read the Hebrew, if you if you understand Hebrew grammar, then you know what's going on here. But Saul and the people spare Agag. What does that mean? In Hebrew, when there is a compound subject, Saul and the people, people, and when the verb is singular, and when the first noun is the key, key act actor, so it is Saul who spared the who spare Agag, not the people. He is the primary one who did it, who offended the Lord. So what is going on? Saul is twisted, self-deceived, 100%. It was he who made the people listen to him. Now when confronted about his sin of sparing Agar, he twists the thing up 100% around. Well, perhaps we have also experienced this. Have you ever had a boss, boss who tell you to do something and then you mess up and say, hey, I have not asked you to do this. Well, excuse me, you just, you clearly say that this is what you want to do. Well, this is Saul. Well, maybe your, your boss is not so malicious as you think. This is human nature. Self-deceived. Self-deceived. When we were confronted by our wrongs, we are often self-deceived. But don't look at your boss. Look at yourself. Maybe you're doing the same thing to your children. To your subordinate. So, 
application examine our motivation when being confronted are we saying telling the truth what's the application the, the application is self deceased deception what is a self-deceived confession maybe so self-deceived uh, 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 self-deception there are three features first so distorted God's word he claimed to have obeyed God when he did not second he distorted the people's word the people did not make him listen third he contradicted his own word previously what did he say I have obeyed the word of the Lord now he's saying that I have obeyed the voice of the people so these are the features so our, 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 our application is when we confess are we self-deceiving or not verse 24 now therefore please pardon my sin pardon in Hebrew is lift up remove please remove my sin and return with me that I may bow that means worship before the Lord now this is important who is whose forgiveness is, is Saul requesting Samuel he's requesting a pardon a forgiveness from Samuel that raises an important theological question is Samuel's forgiveness equivalent to God's what is the difference of course not no one can represent God to forgive anybody right well a, a prophet can represent God to forgive only when he receives a message so which means that Saul is not really seeking forgiveness from God he's only seeking forgiveness from man we know that prophet is, is only a mouthpiece now so what does that mean that means to Saul Samuel's forgiveness is more important than God's forgiveness so this actually this um, relates to one issue church discipline church discipline is the guilty person seeking forgiveness from the church church leader or seeking forgiveness from God man's approval now what is really unexpected in this word verse is return with me why is this so unexpected now because return with me is actually reveals Saul's real concern he actually doesn't really care about Samuel's forgiveness or not all he cares about is whether Samuel will return with him now the self-deception is what is so that he may worship God now that's a theological question Saul's logic Samuel's presence is a must for him to worship God another question is forgiveness a prerequisite for worship first question is yes and no yes in Matthew we know that we need to reconcile with our brother before we our worship will be accepted so this is true but what is wrong with uh, Saul's theology is Samuel's forgiveness does not represent God there's no substitution for God's forgiveness so his request for Samuel to return is misguided now then another question is can Saul not worship God without Samuel Samuel return of course not worship is between the worshiper and God no human approval is needed so Saul's theology is wrong again now the thing is I think Saul's mind he, if he could seek Samuel's approval of his worship he assumed that God would also accept him and perhaps to Saul it's easier to seek human approval than God's forgiveness so I get a six pawn on Saul's confession first no admission of his own wrong no remorse 
no repentance. Second, he continued to shift responsibility. Do you know I have searched the entire scripture? Everyone who have said I have sinned, nobody make justification like Saul. You know what the other people were doing? I have sinned. Ask the prophet to intercede. Even Pharaoh did that. Ask for a relief of punishment. Saul didn't do any of that. And Saul's object of confession was wrong. He made his confession to Samuel, not to God. His request for forgiveness is also to Samuel, not to God. No request for God to relent or change his mind about his rejection. Lastly, no promise of remedial action. No attempt to make the wrong right. And you may ask, what is the most important element of a genuine confession? First, realization of sin. That means realize that God is offended. Second, seek forgiveness from God first and then man and ask God to relieve the judgment. Third, take responsibility of the consequence of our own sin. So don't follow Samuel's footstep. Samuel needs God's forgiveness. I mean, Saul's footstep. Saul needs God's forgiveness, not Samuel's. Second point, result of confession, rejected and torn. Verse 26, And Samuel said to Saul, I will not return. This is actually quite expected. Why would Samuel return with Saul if such a self-deceived confession? Now the question is, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, uh, and, 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 and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. The question is, why did Samuel repeat God's judgment to him? Now, I have three suggested reasons for this. Repetition is a means of emphatic. So, Samuel was emphasizing the message to Saul, God's message to Saul. So that means that uh, Saul's confession was not accepted. And in addition, more importantly, the first announcement did not get the message across. Apparently, Saul did not get the message. So Samuel will have to reannounce God's rejection in hope that this time Saul may realize God's rejection to him. And theologically, this repet repetition means Saul's fate was sealed final confirmation and no point of return. Now 27. As Samuel turned to go away, Saul seized the skirt of his rope and it tore. Now this is one of the few instances where a, an accent is, has theological s as, 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 as significance. Now think, think a little bit about uh, the tearing of the rope. You see, cease, the subject of cease is Saul. Saul sees the skirt of the rope. You know, to tear a cloth apart requires a bit of strength, right? It's not just normal. So, this, so why the story tells us this? Because I think Samuel and Saul are equally, the force of both of them are equal. So Samuel is equally determined to live as Saul is determined to retain Samuel. As a result, tall, tall tearing is, is a symbolic of God's relationship with Saul and Samuel's relationship with Saul. So this is the significant. Now, uh, this statement um, then, then the Lord said, uh, "This occasion 
the theological significance is this occasion Samuel's announcement of the kingdom being torn again so the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day and has given it a neighbor of yours who is better than you the significance of this verse lies in the fact that the subject changed 27 Saul was the subjects of tearing he sees but then 28 the subject is the Lord now the question who is tearing Saul's kingdom apart tearing it away from him the answer is Saul himself because the first subject was Saul so in God's judgment this is what happened but then more important when we read this uh, uh, passage Oh, sorry, I are here. The Lord has given your kingdom to one better than you, to your friend, literally, the one better than you. How are we to read this statement? This statement must be read against the previous similar statement in the instant where Saul had not waited for Samuel to offer sacrifice in 1 Samuel 13 verse 14 but now your kingdom shall not continue the Lord has shot out a man after his own heart now if we compare the two passages this is where we get the, the theology in chapter 13 uh, both words are perfect so which means the Lord has sought out, has found the Lord has found a person after his own heart now but in this passage it is has given has given mean it is gone done deal so that's a progression so Saul's face was not final God has only found one now this is an official replacement and so this is the symbolic significance of being torn the world being torn kingdom is torn no turning back and is replaced by a better one the one that is after God's heart and then verse 29 and also the glory of Israel will not lie or have regret for he is not a man that he should have regret now this passage this verse has two regrets occurs two times now the interesting thing is this is equivalent to God putting himself on oath there's one last time this regret occur in the end of this chapter verse 35 and Saul did not see and Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death but Samuel grieved over Saul and the Lord regretted contradictory the Lord will not regret but at the end of the chapter the Lord regretted so this is actually an em emphatic the Lord regretted what regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel so this is a very ironic and emphatic way to say that Saul's fate was sealed no turning back now last point verse 30 second confession then he said I have sinned Hebrew is identical with the previous I have sinned so the second time Saul confessed yet honor me now before the elders of my people and before Israel and return with me that I may bow before the Lord your God is Saul's confession the second time genuine obviously not why because this is essentially repeating the same statement earlier except that it's giving one more information a few more information to the readers first observation your God is added last time he didn't say a uh, return that I may bow before the Lord your God this is significant 
because Saul's relationship with God is torn not restored indeed your God has occurred this is the third time previously occurred already two times it was to sacrifice to the Lord your God to Samuel repeated two times now our application of the, our, our theology is worship can we worship with a broken relationship with God well Saul can now the thing is what is his request so he revealed the real motivation why he wants Samuel to return with him. Not because he has to worship. This is a self-deception. The real reason is honor me before the elder and my people. Now that raises theological question. In our worship or service, should man be honored or should Man requests to be honored before people when we worship. The answer is obviously, of course. You know what honor is? Honor is something to be given, not something demanded. And this actually is in direct contradiction with worship. Worship is what? It's to give God honor. So anyone who seeks honor in worship is to rob God of his honor demanding personal honor when you worship God are you seeking your own honor your own enjoyment or honoring God this may not apply to the general believer but to the clergy when we share a message are we seeking our own honor or seeking to honor the God, the uh, honor God. Now this raises another theological, practical issue in church discipline. Private confession should one protect the honor of the guilty party. Not many scriptural passages address this. Now the problem is, if you do that, what will happen is, it will be hypocritical. It will be uh, dishonoring God. So, but Samuel returned with Saul. See, this is problematic. Why did Samuel return with Saul? So Samuel, verse, 30, well, verse 31, So Samuel uh, turned back after Saul, and Saul bowed down bowed before the Lord let me uh, let me try to explain this I think there are two reasons why Samuel returned with Saul the first reason is if we compare the two passages we, we realize that the only addition is the elders of the people so here one reason is Samuel was trying to protect the reputation of Saul so that Saul can continue to lead Israel Otherwise, that may have a strong impact to the nation. But the real reason is in 32 and 33, verses 32 and 33. Then Samuel said, Bring here to me Agag, king of Amalekites. And Agag came to him cheerfully. Surely the bitterness of death is past. Why the author tells us this little story? And then Samuel killed Agag. Now, you need to understand in light of two observations. First, killing of Agag was after the worship. So, which means that uh, had Samuel not returned, will Saul kill Agag? The answer lies into these two little words. Agag was coming cheerfully. He was surely that he would not be killed. Now the problem with to kill Agag is make Saul's wrong right. The reason Samuel returned with Saul is because Samuel realized that with two confessions, none of them, them are genuine. Saul will go back and will not kill Agag. By not killing Agag, A -A Agag so this is the Agag is devoted to devotion, it's haram. Not killing him will incur judgment to Israel. 
is a very serious problem. But from our perspective, Saul's problem was he has no intention to make up for his wrong. And that is why these two little verses tell us very important, very significant. Let me conclude and review what we have looked at this morning. A deceptive confession is a repeated confession not focused on God, but on man. No remorse, no repentance, no plan to rectify wrong. No attempt to reconcile with God. Wrongly motivated. Man oriented. Not only, not only that, it also seek honor from man. Seek to protect his faith. Not acceptance by God. You know the result? Complete rejection by God. Divine grieving. You know the irony? Saul is the only character in the entire Old Testament that died a most ignoble death. Saul was stripped naked, head cut off, hung on the wall. This is how God repay somebody who seek who rob God's honor. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, help us. Perhaps this is time for us to make a confession to you. Lord, we see all the difficult situations that we're experiencing in Hong Kong. Lord, help us, ask the Holy Spirit to examine us, to see if there's any way we have offended you. Anything that we need to confess before you will ask for your forgiveness will ask for the forgiveness of Hong Kong for the people that are sinning in the city will ask you for the protection from the virus from your judgment and we pray this in Jesus name Amen